What do you guys want? What do you want? What is it? It's not time yet. It's not five o'clock yet. Five o'clock is the one with the little curl on the bottom. The dogs don't think I know what time it is. They're always trying to pull a fast one on me. But I know what the hour is, and it is not five o'clock yet. Last week, I have to humbly admit that I really doubted the weather forecasters. In my own defense though, it did arrive a day late, but it stayed for three days over the weekend. We had snow all three days, howling wind, snow drifts all over the place. It was a major winter event. This was the fourth biggest snowstorm since Denver started keeping records. I even had to get out and shovel the driveway three times over the weekend. This Sunday is the fifth Sunday of Lent and it inaugurates what is typically called Passion Tide or the two weeks before Easter. In the ancient church, the monks that lived in isolation in the desert or in caves would return to their monasteries or main churches for these two weeks. In the Roman Catholic and some Anglican traditions, crosses and images are typically covered with a reddish purple veil during this time, hence why it is also referred to as the veiled passion. Some think this arose off John 8:59, where Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. And this whole idea of concealing or hiding himself it might be where they get this idea of veiling the crosses and various images. John 8:59 was also a passage that was read in many medieval lectionaries during this week. Or it could have arisen as a practice associated with mourning. Concealing the crosses and the images was a way of preparing the church to mourn for Christ's death in two weeks. We need to go over to the desk now and look at John chapter 12, verses 20 through 23, the reading out of John's gospel for this Sunday. Welcome to the Caffeinated Bible. If this is your first time here, my name is David Paris, and for the past 25 to 30 years, I've been teaching seminary around the world. And what I hope to do on this channel is take what I've been teaching and translate that to video on YouTube. My goal is to encourage you to read your Bible in a more informed and stimulating manner. So if you like this channel, be sure to subscribe and give it a thumbs up if you find this video useful. That helps YouTube tell other viewers that this is a good video and when they search for something, it'll help them find it. The reading from the lectionary that I want to focus on this week is the reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verses 20 through 33 in particular, the middle section of that. One of the things I always try and teach my students is what I call the exegetes cheer. Context, context, context. What do these words mean in this passage, in this book? So we need a little context here. The first 11 chapters of John's Gospel are often called the Book of Signs. It focuses on Jesus' public ministry of teaching and working miracles. The miracles that Jesus performs in the first 11 chapters all point forward to the hour of glory. In chapter two, for example, when Jesus and his disciples crash the wedding at Cana, his mother pressures him to do something about the lack of wine. Jesus replies to her in verse four, woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. After healing the lame man by the pool, Jesus declares in chapter five, verse 25, very truly I tell you, the hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Once again, we see this reference to the hour. Then John chapters 12 through 21 are often referred to as the book of glory. Jesus' ministry is not so much to the public, but more restricted to his disciples. And the focus is on his arrest passion, death, and resurrection. 
Chapter 12 opens up with Mary anointing Jesus in verses 1 through 11. Jesus interprets her actions as preparation for his death. We move from Mary's house to Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem in verses 12 through 18, with the crowd singing, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Now they're acclaiming Jesus as the Messiah who will come and save Israel. They're really expecting Jesus to fulfill this role of Messiah, much like a political king, someone to replace Herod that would lead Israel and restore Israel back to its glory under King David. In verse 16, John tells us that the disciples, and by extension the crowds, don't understand what's taking place. They're most likely still running on their messianic aspirations or assumptions. Then in verse 19, the Pharisees complain that the whole world has gone after him. Remember John's use of irony and people saying things that they don't fully understand. And if you can check out my video on dialogue for more use of irony, especially in John's gospel. John uses what the Pharisees are saying to show two things. One, that Jesus came into the world to save the world. John 3.16, which we looked at last week. And once again, I'll have another link to that video. Second, that people outside of Israel will now come to Jesus. This brings us to the text that we're looking at today. John 12, verses 20 through 33, or the hour of glorification. So let's read John chapter 12. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered him, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will be my servant also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it's for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the rule of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. And he said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. John chapter 12, verses 20 through 33. It's in the midst of the triumphal entry that our story takes place. Some of the Greeks are in Jerusalem and probably in this triumphal entry, then approach Philip. And so this is why context is very important. It helps you understand what's about to take place here. Now, the way John uses this term Greeks, it probably refers to either Gentiles who are in the process of converting to Judaism or to people that were from a Greek background that lived in Jerusalem and may not have any association at all with the Jewish faith. By calling them Greeks, John wants us to see that these are not Jews, or at least not Jewish in the sense of the disciples or the other people. They're probably not raised within a Jewish culture, learned to speak Hebrew, and not from that cultural background. These people are from another cultural background, that of the Greco-Roman world. Now, in the Gospels, when Jesus interacts with people who are not from a Jewish background, oftentimes the authors will call special attention to this. And there's not many of them. We have the Syrophoenician woman who begs Jesus to heal her daughter. You have the centurion in Luke's Gospel who asks Jesus to heal his servant. And then in John chapter 4, we had the story of the Samaritan woman who has this very interesting dialogue with Jesus at the well in Samaria. And it's interesting, as just a little side note here, to notice how the Greeks approached Jesus. 
They approach Philip first, who then takes them to Andrew. Now, if you were in the midst of this crowd and your native tongue was Greek, then you would most likely try and seek out someone who spoke Greek as well or was from that background. Now, we're not sure if Philip and Andrew spoke Greek, but we do know that they have Greek names. And this may indicate that their family had dealings with Greeks or they learned Greek or that they were bicultural or bilingual in some sense. We really don't know, but it's interesting to note that these Greeks specifically seek out Philip and Andrew, disciples with Greek names, when they seek to approach Jesus. Now, when they tell him that there are Greeks wishing to see him, Jesus declares, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified in verse 23. Now, remember, I talked about how the Pharisees complained that the whole world had gone after him. And this was ironic because when they say it, it means a lot more than what they think it does. Now in this passage, we actually see the world coming to Jesus, running after him, and it's represented by these Greeks who are asking to see Jesus. The hour has come. In the first 12 chapters of John, this reference to the hour always keeps pointing forward, usually telling us that Jesus' hour has not yet arrived. Now, here in John chapter 12, the hour has arrived. It is here. Now, this hour not only refers to Jesus' arrest, trial, and crucifixion, but also his resurrection. These are like flip sides of the same coin for John. And the metaphor that Jesus is going to tell about the seed immediately after this really illustrates this point. In verse 24, Jesus gives this metaphor of the seed. Very truly, I tell you, Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. And whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will be my servant also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now, from a modern biological point of view, this metaphor does not make sense. We know that a seed contains life within it, and when they are in the ground, the seed germinates and starts a new plant. But in the ancient world, in their view of biology, a seed was viewed as some sort of piece of dead wood. When the seed fell off the plant, it was dead or had died. And then when it's in the ground, a miracle takes place new life springs out of that dead seed. This analogy of the seed was also used by the rabbis when explaining death and the future resurrection. Rabbi Meir was asked if the resurrected will be clothed. When the dead are raised, will they be raised naked or clothed? He replied, like a grain of wheat that goes into the ground naked, but comes up with many garments, the righteous should also expect to be raised with some appropriate attire. And that's in the Babylonian Talmud. In Jesus' use of this metaphor, he uses this image to convey that with the arrival of the Greeks, he is about to die. Just like the seed must fall from the plant and die, so Jesus will also fall to the earth and die. But it doesn't end there. If someone collected the seeds off the head of the grain, they would just remain individual pieces of grain. But if you put them in the ground as seeds, then a miracle occurs. New life springs up. Following this metaphor a bit further, it just doesn't come back as a new seed or a single seed, but it yields much fruit. Jesus is using this to show that he must fall into the earth and die and unless he dies, there will be no fruit, referring to the gathering of the Gentiles and the creation of the church. Now for the challenging part. In verses 25 and 26, Jesus doesn't leave this metaphor there. He now transfers or extends this to all who believe in him as well. If we love our lives, we'll lose it, but those who hate their lives will keep it for eternity. Now, he's using a hyperbole here. If we love or we try and hold on to our life, then we won't experience salvation. We keep it to ourselves. But in John's gospel, salvation is exchange. We exchange our life for Christ, and now Christ lives within us. 
So by giving over our life to Christ, we're losing it, or in the sense that he puts it there by this hyperbolic statement that we hate our life, by giving our life over to Christ, now we have eternal life. If we keep this within the metaphor of the seed, we need to yield our lives to Christ. We need to give them up. We need to let our seed drop into the ground. When we do this, Christ then creates new life in us and we gain eternal life. And in the context of this analogy, we should also be bearing fruit as well. As the famous missionary Jim Elliott wrote, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. In verses 27 through 33, we see Jesus' existential anguish over the arrival of this hour. My soul is deeply troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it's for this reason that I have come to this hour. The dark night of Jesus' soul has arrived, and with this, we move into our journey into the last two weeks of Lent. Now, in the next week or two, I hope to announce a new round of some pretty cool giveaways. So stay tuned. I'm pretty excited about this, but I have to make sure the deal closes first. Till next week, as we continue our journey through Lent, peace.